A very good evening. Welcome to Live Irish Myths. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Mythical Ireland and this is episode 114. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. It's Monday again and we've gone, of course, to weekly episodes from the original daily episodes, which we did for 102 episodes. Hope you're all uh, enjoying your Monday or if you're on the other side of the world, your Tuesday morning. I want to say a very, very special hello this evening to the viewers on YouTube where uh, Mythical Ireland today passed the 10,000 subscriptions uh, mark. Uh, Mythical Ireland on YouTube has 10,000 subscribers. And it's something I realize from watching other people's YouTube videos that I never do, which is to say subscribe below at the end of the video. But anyway, uh, a, a nice um, milestone. I think you'll agree. Uh, so I'm going to welcome all the YouTubers first. And of course, uh, it shouldn't be any great surprise, but the first of the commenters on YouTube is Daisy Peters, who says, Hello, my dearest Tua de Mythflix, Cade Mila Folja, Anthony and everyone. Blessings and greetings from me and from Rio de Janeiro. Deborah Williams says, Hello, everyone, from a rainy, cloudy Hillsborough, Maryland. Hope you're all doing well. Hi, Daisy. It was a beautiful day today here, sunny and warm, but it has clouded over. It is completely overcast now. And there is some rain forecast for tonight, but that's Ireland. Uh, Mandy McCurl. Hello, Mandy. Says hello to a greetings from a breezy and brilliantly sunny Isle of Mull. You still have the sun, Mandy. I hope everyone is staying safe and well. A wee bit of a trip down memory lane with Rosemary Sutcliffe for me tonight. Me too, uh, Mandy. And that's one of the big reasons I wanted to do it. Um... Archaeoastronomy Database, whose name I think is Tyrrell, says, Hello, Anthony and all my friends. Can't wait to hear this story. Good stuff. Glad to have you in the house, as always. Welcome along. Uh, the Full Irish uh, says, Falcha, evening all. Another fine day on the sod. Yes, indeed, but taking a break for the night, but sure, who cares, so long as the sun shines during the day. John Main says, Banachti Gachtina. Hope you're all makulior in you. John, we're all in good form. Good to see you back again. Hope. Life is treating you well in sunny San Francisco. Stephen Walker says, Gia Gritch, everyone. Gia Gritch, Stephen, welcome along. Archaeoastronomy Database says, 10,000. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. Erica Bow says, good afternoon. Trinonawa, Erica, welcome. Uh, go, uh, slaunch it. Aaron O'Leary says, hi, Anthony and Tua from Boston. Hello, indeed, and good evening. Aaron, good afternoon to you from the Boyne Valley. Naomi Serafina says, Giariv a Mokharja, Tome Arash Arish, Augusta Mojash Shiv a Ekol. She's back and she's glad to see us all. I've missed you all and I'm grateful my work hours changed so I can be here. Happy days. Brilliant stuff, uh, Naomi. Uh, so that little email to your boss worked. Never mind. That was a terrible joke. Mez Marion says, Blessings for us all. I made it. Hello, Marion. Judith Nyland is in the house. Hey, friend. Fabulous to be in the same time zone for a change. Oh, yes, indeed, Judith. Yes, of course. So we don't have to deduct the uh, eight hours as we normally do. Caroline Flanagan says, would love to hear you talk on Irish folklore, such as the little people and banshees, etc. Well, stay tuned to the series, Caroline, because that's all coming up. Sandrine Brady says, bonsoir d'Orléans, Dorlian, France. Hope everyone is fine. Nice to be back with you all, dear Tua. Bonsoir, Sandrine, and on fa oh my goodness me, on Facebook, uh, Sandra Boothroyd says, "Evening, sir." Evening, Sandra Falcha. Judy McQueen says, "Hello, all." Karen Gogus is in the house and says, "Yay!" <laughs> Hello, Karen. Lloyd Stillwell says, "Hello from Missouri in the USA." Falcha, Lloyd. Richard O'Morda says, "Fair play to you." Hello, Richard Falcha. Barbara Barney says, "Hi, Anthony. Hi, everyone. Gia Gritch. Marianne Dunn Kindia says hi from Connecticut. Hello, Marianne. Nice to see you along. Elaine Dent Lingenfelter is here from her house deep in the heart of Texas. I'd say it's warm there at the moment, Elaine. Is it? Hope you're avoiding the uh, hurricanes. Uh, Donna Jean Porter says hi. Falcha. Nolan Proctor says hello again from Pennsylvania. Hello, Nolan. Scott Taggart says Gilgrich all. Uh, hello, Scott. Charlene McLean Cosby is. Says afternoon from North Carolina, Falchuk, Charlene. Terrilan Zahariah says hello from Colorado. Fantastic. Hello, Terrilan. Lovely mixture of states. And speaking of mixture, Mike and Jeanette are in the house from uh, Princeton in New Jersey. Falchuk, uh, Mike and Jeanette. Lovely to see you both. 
Chris Delaney Cooney says, good afternoon from Rhode Island, yet in a smallest state, from the smallest county in Ireland, County Louth, to the smallest state in the USA. Fault you, Chris. Nick Eska Casterton says, good evening, Anthony. Hope you're in fine fettle. Hello. All the fantastic too. A fault you, Nick. Welcome along. Barb Jordan says, hi, everyone. Good evening. Karima Mc McDwyer BSC says, greetings from Egypt. Well, there you go. Fantastic. Hello to Egypt from the Boyne Valley. Larissa Kama says, greetings to and Anthony from a beautiful Portland, Oregon. So good to see everybody here today. Also great to see you, Larissa. Welcome along. Ralph Waldron says, hi, great day, but cloudy now. Yes, exactly the same here, Ralph. Welcome along. Kelly Edmiston says, there you are. Hello, my Tua tribe. Folge Kelly. Great to see you. Welcome along. Julianne Osborne is watching. Hello, Julianne. Uh, looks like our Anthony got a haircut. Looks nice. The first proper professional haircut since, uh, probably since February, actually. Um, I've been kind of doing it myself over the, the months, but a proper professional job this time. Um, Mariana Dunn says, greetings and blessings, dear Tua and Anthony from Virginia. Folge Mariana. Patricia Healy Sullivan is saying, hello, Tua from mythical Vermont. Hello, Patricia. Welcome. Laura McCormick says, hello, all from a rainy county Limerick, but always happy to hear a few myths. So the rain is already happening in Limerick, so it's on its way. Hello, Laura. Uh, Kristen Murray Andre says, hi, Anthony and all. No remote learning for the kids today, so it's my turn. Yeah, uh, some of ours were back to school proper today for the first time since the 12th of March. They actually enjoyed it. Mavanwe Millward says, Gia Reeve, Anthony and the lovely Tua, Mythflix Tua from Mid Wales. Sorry, I'm sorry it's been so long. Great to see you and looking forward to hearing the mythical tales tonight. Good evening, Movanwe, and lovely to see you back again. Andrea Lagoya says, Ciao, Anthony, nice to stay with you. Ciao, Andrea Falcha, good evening. Alex Casterton says, Hello, Anthony and Tua. Dry here in Albion today. Few ciders with my brother tonight, so I'll watch back in a bit. Hope you and the lovely Tua are okay. Hail the gods, hail Dogda. Falcha, Alex, enjoy the ciders. Tom King says, good evening, Anthony and all the friendly two. I hope all in good form. Looking forward. It's story time. Hello, Tom. Great to see you. Hope you're in good fettle. Neil McDonald says, evening. Do you know what? Neil Ann McCallum is in the house. Says, hello, Anthony, the mighty two the Danon. A wonderful day today. Congratulations on the amazing achievement of inspiring 10,000 subscribers. And thank you for the awesome celebratory video and the beautiful accompanying words. By the way, that is for patrons only today. <laughs> so just in case the rest of you are wondering, I've poured myself a lovely glass of wine to help you celebrate. Slaunch you. Brilliant stuff, and I'm delighted to hear it. Enjoy that. Uh, Brady Tussie says, good day, Anthony, from Arizona. Fulcher Brady, welcome along. Catherine Woodruff is in soggy central Wisconsin. Well, hello, Catherine. I think it's, it's going to get soggy here again, as it always does in Ireland. Susan Scott says, hello, Anthony and all the two. Are good to be with you all. It's great to have you along, Susan. Burr Whelan says, hi, Anthony, and hi, everyone. Gia Glitch, Burr. Una Sheehan is in the house. Hi, Anthony, here with Liam. Hello, Una and Liam. Very welcome along to the... You're both very welcome along. Raymond Lawson says, greetings from San Francisco. Raymond, it's great to have you in the house. Rex Fortenbury says... A big old cosmic howdy to you and the rest of the mighty tour, and yes to the calendar. Yes, indeed. Um, seems to be a good response there, which is great. Laura McCormick says, Jet Mila, the tribe is huge. Uh, hello, Laura. Welcome along. Michael Porter says, good evening from Texas, from husband of Donna Jean, who's listening somewhere else in the house. <laughs> that's brilliant. Hello, Michael. Michael D., Yes, that's our president's name. Well, his surname is Higgins, but we won't, you know, that's not important. Uh, that's brilliant. The two of you are listening in separate locations in the house. <laughs> Fantastic. Welcome along. Uh, Roberta Duffy is in California. First time listening. Welcome along, Roberta, to Live Irish Mits. It's great to have you along. Fault you. Adina Sparks says, uh, afternoon, Anthony and the two. Uh, yes, indeed, Adina. Lovely to see you again. Bernie Courtney says, good evening, everybody. Fault you, Bernie. Bethany Cutler says, Fulcher from Idaho. Bethany, I did get a message from you today. It was you, wasn't it? Uh, and I didn't respond because I was working, but I will respond later. Thank you for that. Teresa McGuinness says, North Florida here again. Hello, Teresa in North Florida. Fulcher. 
Donna Firer says, hello, everyone tuning in from Maryland, a drizzly, quiet day. Well, come here, listen, every day that's a quiet day is a good one, as far as I'm concerned. Maureen, given, given everything that's happening in the world, a quiet day is a good one. Maureen Norton Senuta says, hello, Boston. Fall to Maureen and say hello to all the people in Boston. Wandy, uh, I'm sorry, Wandy Nagtigal says, hi from Holland. Good to hear slash see you again. Hello, Wandy. Very nice to have you along. Denise Murphy, another Murphy in the house, is in Connecticut. School starts tomorrow. We'll miss live. Thank you so much. I enjoyed and learned so much. Well, we're only on once a week, Denise, on Mondays. But sure, come here. If you don't see it live, you can catch up afterwards on the videos. So there's no problem. Steve Martinson says, hello, everyone from Madison, Wisconsin. Be safe. Be well, everyone. Fall to Steve. Same to yourself. Be safe. Doris O'Hara is saying, hi, Anthony and everyone. Fall to Doris. Welcome along. Nora Gaffney O'Connor says, Giorgiv Galer, Anthony Agasantua, sea is still cold. Not surprising. Went for a moonlight swim last night. It was magical. Calendar, a great idea. Don't forget to put moon phases and in bulk lunasa and important dates like that. It'd be brilliant. Yes, indeed. Wouldn't it just? I think Coda is just reminding me. That... But I'm not going to be talking about the dogs tonight. We're, we're only talking about his birth and his childhood. Yeah, I know, but we'll, we'll get that bit. We'll, we'll do that. He's telling me we have to talk about Finn McCool's dogs. Um, Siobhan Strickland says hi from Detroit. Hello, Siobhan. Shane O'Hanley uh, is calling in somebody and saying interesting stuff. I hope you do find it interesting, Shane. You're welcome along. Maria Rodriguez Doyle says hello, love from Spain. Fall to Maria. Great to see you back again. Uh, wonderful to have you along. Desiree Riley's in the house. Hello, lovely Tua. Happy to be here today from a storm-battered Louisiana. Very glad to hear that you got through it. I saw some of your videos and it looked nasty, I'll tell you. So um, good stuff, Desiree. Great to see you. Hail and healthy. Shane says, hello from the Irish Can Canadian in Ottawa. Falcha, Shane. Great to see you along. Rogue Vulcan says, hey, <laughs> hey, Rogue Vulcan. I suspect that's not your real name, but I, I could be wrong. Rowan Grove says, hello from Colorado. We finally got a little rain last week. I saw that, Rowan. Great news. Great news. Aaron Lyle says, greetings from San Diego. Hello, Aaron. Falche. Patricia Wardell says, ciao from Trieste. Falche, Patricia, welcome along. It's great to see you. Uh, Una says, can you put up the volume a bit? No, I can't control the volume. The volume is controlled on your side, not on mine. So uh, unfortunately, uh, this is as loud as, as it goes. Um, Dolmac McDermott says, hi, Anthony and the Tua from Bray. Falcha, Dolmac, great to see you along. Reese Casterton says, hey, Anthony and the Tua. A Steiner glass of golden cider to your health. Oh, I say it all. Yes, well, I don't imbibe um, cider. But I'm very fond of a uh, little, just between us now, <laughs> not to be shared around. I don't mean the drink, I mean the information. I'm very fond of the occasional glass of, well, I prefer Pinot Grigio, but uh, I, 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 I'm not that fussy, you know. Nice glass of white wine. Um, Sherry Kinkle, is it? Uh, says, good afternoon from Colorado. Family was... From County Cork, the Kelly clan was in Ireland five years ago. Brilliant stuff. Sherry, welcome along. Raymond Lawson is in the house with his uh, little, uh, what do you call those? Um, character, 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 no, it's not a caricature. I don't know. You maybe tell me what it, when you get a, draw, a little drawing of yourself. Um, I think Facebook's doing those now. now. I'm so far behind with technology. It's terrible. I'm, I'm a dinosaur in many respects. Okay, Aaron Durrett is in the house. Dear Anthony and Tua, hello. So glad to see you all again and be back around the fire with you. Aaron, we missed you. Your absence was noted. I was, I was taking little notes in my little black book, but it's wonderful to have you back. Great to see you. Uh, I think it was Desiree told us last week that you had just missed it. You were, you were just returning. So hello and welcome back. Great to see you. Porigo Komiski. Is in the house. Fabulous day today all along the Boyne Valley. Porrick was visiting the great monuments of the Boyne Valley today. Thanks, Porrick. It's great to see you in the house as well. Okay. 
all these are repeated. Sandra Boothroyd, names getting longer. Hmm. Taking up our mitts time. Yes, Laura Mullen is watching from Sacramento. Hello, Laura. It's taken 21 minutes. It's, I think 20, 21 or 22 minutes is the longest introduction. So uh, this is this is good going, actually, in comparison. Alwyn Roy Badziak is in the house, says, Hello, Anthony and Tua from Berkshire. Glad to sit down after a busy day. Well, you just sit down there now and grab yourself a brew or a dram and uh, relax and take it easy. Uh, Laura McCormack said, I had a border collie that I named Bran. I would swear he was human once. <laughs> Kaylee During says, e e Good evening, Anthony. Congratulations on 10,000 subscribers. That's incredible. Oh, no, no, oh, no, 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 no. What did I do? Pressed the wrong thing. Sorry. Oh, don't do that. I keep, I'm, all I want to do is, I'm trying to type press C more. I'm five away from 1,000. I'm one-tenth of the way to your amazing success. Maybe one day in about a decade or so, I'll reach the same milestone. Oh, I'd say it'll be quicker than that, Kaylee. Did I hear the Hound of Ulster? Shane O'Hanley wants to know. The Hound of Leinster in this case, but really close, you know? Um, Roberta Duffy. Thank you. I'm excited to join the tribe. Brilliant stuff. Emoji, Shane says. Yeah, sorry. I know. I should know these things. But Avatar, uh, says Burr Whelan. Tracy O'Connor is in the house, says, Hello, folks. Long time no see. Can't be long. Just popping in to say hello. My short Anthony. <laughs> Thanks. It's just, it's it's my colour, isn't it? Good evening to you. <laughs> Peter Kennedy says, Good evening. He's speaking of Balia Brigine. Peter Kennedy says, Good evening. From Bal Balia Brigine or Balbriggan in County Dublin. Peter, great to see you. Kimberly Halligan says, Hi, Anthony and Tua. Great to catch the session live. Brilliant stuff and great to have you along. Barbara Murphy, another, yet another Murphy in the Murphy house says, Hello. I'm in. Hello to all the Tua Fault you. Brilliant stuff. Great. I'm going to flick through now because I know. Uh, Cy B says, good evening. Hello, Cy. Laura Mullen, my granddaughter, Persephone, aged eight, is waiting for your stories too. Brilliant. Good. So let's call that 17 minutes. So just uh, very quickly before we actually start proper, uh, a few announcements. As you'd probably know, Island of the Setting Sun 2020 edition is on the print, print, printers. Actually, it's, uh, it's a week and a half since it was signed off for print. Uh, as soon as I have definitive information as to when I'll have copies in my hand, you will all know about it. Don't forget to get your pre-order in on the Mythical Ireland website. And I'm going to paste in the link to where you can pre-order right now so that uh, if you haven't done, you can pre-order your signed copy. It is a limited print run. Um, and I know what has happened in the past uh, when this book's second edition was coming to the end of the print run and it was decided there wasn't another, another print run and the uh, the copy started to get horrendously expensive so uh, make sure to get your order in as soon as you can uh youtube uh, we've covered but just in case you are watching on youtube don't forget to subscribe uh calendar um i asked earlier on um, because people have been urging me to do a calendar and apparently uh something like 98 percent of people think it's a good idea uh, so keep uh, i've actually um, I, I, I need to go away and make inquiries about that. Um, I have plenty of pictures. The great difficulty with designing a calendar with 12 months in it is that I have 12 pictures plus one on the cover, so 13 to choose from several hundred. So that's going to be the difficult part of that task. But anyway, keep an eye on that. Uh, and as soon as I have firm details, I'll set up again pre-ordering um, so you can get your order in for uh, Christmas because I know a lot of people will want them for Christmas to give us presents. Uh, and obviously, it'll be a 2021 calendar. Let's hope 2021 has better things to offer than 2020 did. But look, you you know, 2020 hasn't been bad for everybody. So, um, uh, and those of you who are on Patreon, um, uh, thank you for your patronage. Uh, and just to say that that special celebratory video is at the moment only visible to Mythical Ireland patrons. And a couple of things that were added recently on pa Patreon. Uh, 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 there was one real exclusive uh, for patrons. Um, and, I, and I needed to mention this. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, patrons uh, at the uh, Iron Age level and above 
uh, were given access to a very special uh, exclusive Nouth poster that I specially designed featuring 33 different images of Nouth. Now, this is a giant uh, PDF and a high quality print quality uh, featuring some of my best photographs of Nouth. Uh, and that was uh, a download so that these people could go off and get it printed out themselves. Um, so that's just one of the things that was published in the last fortnight. Uh, you'll know that I mentioned previously that the the long the long article called Scribes and Kings, Religion, Politics and the Medieval Manuscripts of Ireland. Uh, that is also currently exclusive. Um, and uh, also uh, about five, no, actually a week ago today, uh, 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 patrons were given access to uh, a drone video of um, uh, Ishnak. Um, so patrons only. Sorry, Tracy's reminding me. Yes, thank you, Tracy. I'm just pasting in the link to the Patreon. So it's patreon.com forward slash mythical Ireland. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash mythical Ireland. So you're not just throwing money away. You're um, investing in mythical Ireland research and you're getting rewarded for it. So there you go. So tonight, oh, okay, start the episode proper. Um, I need to introduce this. When I was a child, I had this book on my shelves. I didn't actually have much about Irish mythology on my shelves when I was young. And it is The High Deeds of Finn McCool uh, by Mary, Ro sorry, Rosemary Sutcliffe. This was published in, I think it was the early 70s or the late 60s, yeah, 1967, reprinted 1972. Um, uh, a puffin, uh, which I think is an imprint of Penguin, isn't it? A, a puffin classic. And this was sort of fairly widely available. I don't know what happened to it. I mean, I had hundreds of books when I was a kid. Surprise, surprise. Um, actually, myself and uh, some of my siblings at one point. This will not surprise you at all. Myself and some of my siblings, um, we catalogued all our books. Uh, we actually came up with a catalog and we stamped them all uh, with addresses and telephone numbers and such things. Uh, and I think at one point we had, oh, I don't know, hundreds anyway. We had several hundred books in our little kiddies library. Anyway, this was one of them, and I don't know what happened to it. But recently, I was in a secondhand bookshop where I actually do get a lot of the stuff that's on the shelves in the background. Uh, it comes from very good secondhand bookshops. And this was there, and the price tag on the cover was a little sticker saying one euro. And I just thought, wow, I haven't seen that in years. And for one euro, I really, really couldn't turn it down. And uh, now, if you're on ABE Books, um, I think there's plenty of copies available on there if you're interested in, um, sorry, uh, I'll just quickly, hopefully, paste a link in where you can have a look. Uh, so um, there are copies there available for as little as £2.84. That's the, uh, the UK version. That's abebooks.co.uk. Uh, so you could get one without having to uh, pay too much. I'm going to have to do another library tour at Movanway because I did two or three, didn't I? But um, everything's been thoroughly rearranged now, so I'll have to go back and, and introduce some of the titles that have been uh, added over the last few months. Uh, Stephen Walker had a very interesting post on the Mythical Ireland community uh, page today um, about his uh, growing library. Uh, and some of the books that he's purchased, and also some of the books that he's had difficulty acquiring. Um, so maybe uh, at some point, if you're not already a member of the Mythical Ireland community on Facebook, you might consider popping over there. It's uh, very slightly different to the Mythical Ireland page uh, in that it's more about the community, and it's more about you guys making your contribution uh, and commenting on things and posting things. Anyway, so I'm going to read the introduction. Well, I'll read the back cover first. So I can only read one chapter of this because I do not want to breach copyright. Now, as it happens, we'll be doing lots more episodes about Finn and the Fianna and, and the Finn cycle. Uh, but I, will, I would intend to read the rest of those from Lady Gregory's book because that's out of copyright and there's no issue with copyright. Uh, but we have a sort of a fair use protocol in Ireland, which means that, you know, so long as it's within limits, you can read uh, a, a small amount of someone's work. In the hidden glens of Schlieve Bloom, 
Finn grew from a babe into a child and from a child into a boy. And the women trained him in all the ways of the wild so that by the time he was a youth, he was such a hunter that he could bring a flying bird out of the sky with one cast of a sling stone and run down the deer on his naked feet without even a hound to help him. And if these descriptions uh, make him sound a little bit like Cúchulain and perhaps a little bit like Lou, we shouldn't be surprised. One, At least one scholar has suggested that Finn McCool is just a, a later version of the god Lou Lawfather, Lou Samuel Donach. Adina Sparks is just in time is right. Hello. And Joe Butler, I'm later than usual. Greetings to us. So happy to see you all, dear folk. Great. Uh, Joe and Edina. I'm just reading the back cover, actually. I haven't even started reading the chapter proper. So relax and make yourselves comfortable and take it easy. Then the day came for him to fight for his rightful place in the world. And like his father before him, he became captain of the mighty war band, the Fianna, and the greatest team. Sorry, and the greatest there had ever been. Erica Rivertree is also sneaking in the side door as we speak. Hello, Erica. Says, a late Bannock Dio, Louisville, Kentucky, Folge, Erica, Roberta Duffy. I love it. My favourite story. I used to visit Giants Causeway all the time when I was a wee girl. Brilliant stuff, Roberta. Rosemary Sutcliffe tells stories of one of Ireland's most renowned heroes, the warrior Finn McCool, from the days of his greatest glory, to the tragic darkening of his later life. Sounds also, again, like almost like a little summary of Cúchulain, doesn't it? Setanta and Cúchulain. So I will read um, Rosemary Sutcliffe's very brief introduction to the book. If you already know the stories of Cúchulain and the Red Branch Warriors, you will notice a very great difference between them and these stories of Finn McCool. Now, she spells it, of course, it's the anglicised version, Finn McCool. But, uh, well, Finn, people argue about Finn and Fionn. I have a son called Finn, right? And occasionally I get people calling him Fionn. And I say, well, you call him Fionn. And they say, because that's the Irish version. I say, hang on, actually. Uh, the oldest version of the word for white, also connected with this wisdom cult, in, in early Irish is Find, F-I-N-D. Uh, and that later became Finn, F-I-N-N. -N. And I actually think Fionn is the modern Irish version. So there you go. The older version is Finn. But Macool, uh, the correct full Irish spelling is C-U-M-H-A-I-L. And that means uh, Finn, uh, son of the hazel or uh, the bright son of the hazel, as I like to say. Also, if you've read Island of the Setting Sun, or if you've ordered the 2020 edition, you'll see how I refer to the starry son of the hazel. Mm, I'll leave that one with you. Both, the st okay, it, it, the, the stories of Cúchulain and the Red Branch and Finn McCool, both concern the adventures of Irish heroes, their loves and hates, their battles with strange and supernatural beings. Yet they belong to two quite different worlds. It seems right and fitting that the Red Branch stories should be set in the wild, harsh countryside of Northern Ireland. They are wild, harsh tales. Their magic is darkly and fiercely splendid. Their people are very real, so that one loves and hates them and suffers and rejoices with them. They have the quality which we call epic, which means that if we were deciding their right place on the bookshelves, we should put them somewhere alongside Homer's Iliad, which is the greatest epic of them all. I just love to hear that being said. So when we were in secondary school in a Christian brother's school, that we were taught classical studies and we were taught Greek and Roman mythology and all about uh, the escapades uh, of the deities of that region of the world. And of course, uh, the Roman Empire and the Roman army and all that stuff from the Roman emperors. Um, what we weren't told, unfortunately, sadly, is that Ireland had a, a body of mythology and folklore uh, that would easily uh, e equal or rival that of the classical world. And of course, I had to find that out myself later on. The stories of Finn McCool belong to a later date and are set in the south, many of them in the soft green Killarney countryside. 
And this again seems right and fitting. They belong not to epic, but to folklore and fairy tale. And only here and there, as in the fighting for the river ford, in the hostel of the quickened trees, something of the hero tale remains. The magic changes and shimmers and shifts on ahead of one, just a little out of reach, like the end of the rainbow. The Danons, who in the Red Branch stories were still recognisably gods or half-gods, have become the fairy kind, with only a shred of their lost godhood clinging to them here and there. Time means nothing. Sorry, there's a bit of pages are stuck here. Oshim, the son of Finn, is a young warrior when his son, Oscar, is a young warrior. And in another way also, time means nothing. For the Lachlan raiders, whose battles with the Fianna come so often into the stories, are the Vikings, the Norsemen. And the Norse, Norsemen did not even begin to be sea raiders, let alone reach the Irish coast to long after Finn's day. It is just that later storytellers picked them out of their own time and set them back 500 years or so into Finn's, out of a feeling that the sea raiders were the enemy and therefore the right people for the Fianna to fight. The stories of the Fianna are full of loose ends and contradictions and unexplained wisps of strangeness that seem to have drifted in for no especial reason, except that they are curious or beautiful and happened to be floating by. They are stories made simple, simply for the delight of story making, and I have retold them in the same spirit, even adding a flicker or a flourish of my own from time to time, as everyone who has retold them in the past thousand years or so has done before me. So uh, Rosemary Sutcliffe there basically letting us know uh, that she's rendering the stories as faithfully as possible, but with uh, perhaps slight embellishments here and there. Shane O'Hanley says, hang on a second, I'll take you up on that, Shane. It says, Finn McCool is my favourite. I love the story of Nile of the Nine Hostages also. Chiron, August Antrim Abu. Hang on a second. So is it Tyrone or Antrim? Because, I mean, you can't say, I mean, who do you follow in the GAA? I mean, that'd be like me saying, oh, up loud and up Meath, because like Meath is a few hundred metres that way, but I live in County Loud. Oh, I tell you. You have, you, have to, you have to pin your colours to the mast on that one, Shane. Tell us which, which, one, which one takes preference. This is called The Birth and Boyhood of Finn. In the proud and far back days, though not so far back nor yet so proud as the days of the Red Branch heroes, there arose another mighty brotherhood in Erin, and they were called the Fianna. They were a war host whose task was to hold the shores of Erin safe from invaders. And they were a peace host, for it was their task also to keep down raids and harryings and blood feuds between the five lesser kingdoms into which Erin was divided. Shane is uh, saying Tyrone. Well, there you go. You see, you have to choose. You can't say, t I mean, if they're, what if they're both playing? What if Tyrone and Antrim are playing in the Ulster final? You know, w which side are you going to cheer on? You know, which would you be more happier to see winning? Ulster, Munster, Connacht, Leinster and Meade, or Meath, had each their own companies of the Fianna under their own Fian chiefs. But one captain was over them all. And each and every man must take his oath of loyalty, not to his own king, nor to his own Finn chief alone, but to the captain and to the high king of Erin himself, sitting in his high hall at Tara with his right foot upon the stone of destiny. It's lovely and romantic, isn't it? <laughs> Shane says, good man calling me out. Well, just for the record, um, when I was a, a, a baby, uh, I lived in Meath, uh, and uh, and my second address was in Meath, 
uh, and I think I was four before we moved to County Louth, uh, and that's where I grew up, and I still live in County Louth. So I very much consider myself a, a Louth man. The Fianna came to their most full and valiant flowering and to their greatest power in the time when the hero Finn McCool was their captain and Cormac MacArt, the grandson of Con the Hundred Fighter, was High King of Erin. But the story has its beginning back in the days of Finn's father, Cool MacTrenmore, Lord of the Clan Boscna of Leinster, who was the captain before him, and of Aid MacMorna, Lord of the Clan Morna and Chief of the Connacht Fianna, who sought the captaincy for himself. At Knucha, near where Dublin stands today, a great, a great and bloody battle was fought between Clan Baskna and Clan Morna as two bulls battle for the lordship of the, of the herd. And one of Cool's household warriors wounded Aid in the eye. So sorely that he went by the name of Gull, G O L L, which means one eyed ever after. But this Aid, who was now Gull MacMorna, dealt Cool MacTrenmore a still fiercer blow that cost him not the sight of an eye, but life itself. And he took from Cool's belt a certain bag of blue and crimson dyed crane skin that was the treasure bag of the Fina. This is a, a very, very mysterious artifact, this one. And with the death of Cool and the loss of the treasure bag, the battle went against Clan Boskna. And there was a great slaughter, and those that were left of the Leinster Fianna, including Crimnal, the brother of Cool, as well as the monster men who had stood with them, were driven into exile in the Connacht Hills. And there was blood feud between Clan Boskna and Clan Morna from that day, which was to bring black sorrow upon Aaron in the end. News of the battle and of Cool's death was brought to his young wife, Myrna of the White Neck, and she near her time to bear his child. And Myrna, not knowing that her lord's enemies would not allow any child of his to live after him if they could help it, fled, taking two of her most trusted women with her into the wild fastness of Schlieve Bloom. And that's fast, fastnesses, not vast, fast, F-A-S-T. And there, like a hind lying up among the fern in the white thorn month, when the fawns are brought into the world, she bore a man-child, and not daring to keep him with her for fear of the hunters on her trail. She called him Demna, or Devna, as it might have been pronounced in the old Irish. Martin Dohany says, hello, Anthony, and all the two. We'll catch up on the episode later. Still working. Oh, not to worry, Martin. We'll catch up with you later indeed, but hello anyway. She called him Demna and gave him to the two women bidding them bring him up in the hidden glens of Schlieve Bloom. Until he was of an age to fight for his rightful place as Cool's son. Then, sadly, she went her way alone, and no more is known of her save that at last, after many wanderings, she found shelter with the chieftain of Kerry. In the hidden glens of Schlieve Bloom, Demna grew from a babe into a child, and from a child into a boy, and the women trained him in all the ways of the wild, so that by the time he was a youth, he was such a hunter that he could bring a flying bird out of the sky with one cast of a sling stone, and run down the deer on his naked feet without even a hound to help him. And he knew the ways of wolf and otter, Badger and fox and falcon, as a good hunter master knows the ways of his own dogs. Jennifer Foley is in the house. Fall to Jennifer. Good evening to you. As he grew older, he began to range far and wide from the turf bothy that was all the home he knew. And so one day he came to the hall of a great chieftain, 
before which some boys of his own age were playing Hurley. The game looked to him good, and he asked if he might join in. And they gave him a Hurley stick and told him the rules. <laughs> there are no rules. <laughs> and so, as soon as he got into the way of it, he could play better than any of them, even taking the ball from their best and swiftest player. The next day, he played with them again. And though they divided the teams so that a fourth of all their number were set to play against him, he won the game. The day after, it was half their number. And the day after that, their whole number played against him. But he won those games too. That evening in the hall, the boys told the chieftain of the strange boy who had joined them and beaten their whole double team at Hurley. And what is he like, this boy, asked the chieftain. And what is his name? We do not know his name. Tarini Pendleton is in the house, Banachty. We do not know his name, said the leader among the boys, but he is tall and strong, and the hair of him is as bright as barley when it whitens in the sun at harvest time. If he is as fair as that, then there's only one name for him, said the chieftain, and that is Finn. And Finn, which means fair, he became from that day forward. The chieftain talked of the strange boy to her friend who passed that way on the hunting trail and lodged under his roof for that night. And the friend spoke of him to another. And so, as time went by, rumours of his skill and daring spread like ripples on a pool when a stone is tossed into the water until they came to the ears of Gaul MacMorna. And it seemed to Gaul that if Cool had a son, he would be just such a one as this Finn. Myrna of the White Neck had been heavy with child when she fled to the wilds. What if the child had been safely born and was a son? The boy would be 14 now, just coming to manhood. Gaul MacMorna smelled danger. He mustered the Connacht Fianna, and bade them hunt the boy down. They were great hunters as well as great warriors, the Fianna, and bring bring him back living or dead. Sounds a little bit like Herod, doesn't it? You know, taking the census and, and looking for the uh, looking for the infant Jesus. But one of Finn's two foster mothers was a wise woman, and she saw in a pool of black bog water, in the cupped palms of her hands, how the Fianna of Connacht were hunting the hills for him. And she told the other woman, and together they spoke to Finn. It's very interesting, that um, divination with water. Don't they call that scrying? Um, you know, and I think uh, Jung would have been very interested in any of the water symbolism in mythology. Uh, because water, as he says, is the eternal symbol uh, for the unconscious uh, in dreams. The hunt is out for you, Fosterling. Gaul MacMorna has heard more of you than is for your own good. And his men are questing through the woods to kill you. For you and not Gaul are by rights the captain of the Fianna of Erin. Therefore, the time has come for you to leave this glen. Then Finn took the spear which they gave him and his sling and his warmest cloak and set out on his wanderings. To and fro and up and down the length and breadth of Aaron he walked, sorry, he wandered. Taking service with now this king or chieftain and now that. Cathy May Dayo is in the house. Says hello, everybody. Hello, Falcha. Cathy May. Pardon me. Excuse me. Taking service with now this king or chieftain and now that. 
and so getting his weapon skill and his warrior training against the day when he should stand out into the open and fight for his rightful place in the world. He began to gather to him a band of young men of much his own kind, fierce and gay and daring. And when he felt that the time was come, he led them into Connacht to seek out any of his father's old followers who might yet be living in the hills. The day after they crossed the Connacht border, they came upon a woman bowed all together with grief and keening over the body of a young man outstretched on the stained and trampled grass. Finn stopped where he saw her and asked, What ill thing has happened here? She looked up at him, and her grief was so terrible that the tears falling from her eyes were great drops of blood. Here is my son Glonda, my only son, dead. Slain by Leah of Locher and his followers. Locher uh, being the Irish word for a rushy place or a marsh. If you're a warrior as you seem, go now and avenge his death, since I have no other man to avenge it. So Finn went after this Leah of Luachar and found him and slew him in single combat, the followers of both standing by. And when Leah lay dead, Finn saw that a strange seeming bag of crane skin, dyed blue and crimson, was fastened to his belt. He knelt and untied the belt thong and opened the bag. Inside was a spearhead of fine dark blue iron and a war cap inlaid with silver, a shield with bronze studs about the rim and a gold clasped boar's hide belt. Finn had no knowledge as to why the man should be carrying these things but they looked worth the keeping. So he put them back in the bag and tied the thong to his own belt and he and his companions went on their way. Beyond the Shannon, in the shadowed depths of the Connacht forests, he came upon a clearing in the woods and in the clearing a cluster of branch-woven bothies. And as he looked, Out from the low door holes, one after another came old men, gaunt as wolves in a famine winter, bent and white-haired and half clad in animal skins and rags of old, once brilliant cloth. But each man carried in his hand an ancient sword or spear, for it seemed to them that the strange comers could only be young warriors of the clan Morna who had discovered their refuge at last. And they chose to meet their deaths fighting, rather than go down tamely without a blow. And something about their bearing and the way they handled their weapons even now told Finn that they were the men he had come to seek and he could have howled like a dead man's dog, thinking of the tall and splendid warriors that they had been on the morning that they stood out to fight at Knucha. Then he swallowed the grief in him and cried out to them with joy, You are the clan Baskna. Which of you is Crumnal, the brother of Cool? Then one of the old men stepped forward, sword in hand, and he not yet knowing whether or no he faced Clan Morna, and said fearlessly, I am criminal, the brother of Cool. Finn looked in his old, tired eyes and said, I am Finn, the son of Cool. And he knelt and laid the crane skin bag at the old man's feet for a gift 
since he had nothing else to give. Criminal looked at the bag and cried out in a great voice to come from such a thin and bent old body. The treasure bag of the Fianna. Brothers, the time of our waiting is over. He opened the bag and one by one drew out the things that it contained. The old men and the young men standing round to watch. And it seemed to Finn that the eyes of the old men grew brighter and their backs straighter and the grip of their weapon hands stronger and with each, each object that appeared, the spearhead and the war cap, the shield and the boar's hide belt. Gull MacMorna took this from your father's body after the slaying. And for 18 years, it has been lost to us. Now it returns again to Clan Baskna. And with it will return also the lordship of the Fianna. Go you and take your father's place, for it is yours, Finn McCool. Keep the treasure bag for me, then, said Finn. My comrades, I leave with you to guard both it and you until I send you word to bring it out to me. And again he went his way, alone as the first time. But he knew that there was yet one more thing he had to learn before he was fitted to take his father's place. And he went to study poetry and the tales in which lay the ancient wisdom and history of his people, with a certain druid by the name of Phanegus, who lived on the banks of the River Boyne. In some of the stories, Phanegus is given the appellation Phanegus the Wise. Seven years Phanegus had lived beside the Boyne, and all that while he had been striving by every means that he could think of to catch Finton, the Salmon of Knowledge. See the way Finton is given. The, the Salmon of Knowledge is called Finton. It's incredible. Who lived in a dark pool of the river where a great hazel tree bent its branches and dropped nuts of knowledge into the water. Finton ate the nuts as they fell and their power passed into him. And whoever ate of Finton would possess the wisdom of all the ages. In seven years, a man, and he a druid, may think of many ways to catch a salmon. But Finton, the salmon of knowledge, had escaped them all, until Finn came treading lightly through the woods to be the old man's pupil. Soon after that, Finnegus caught the salmon quite easily, as though it had simply been waiting its own chosen time to be caught. Finnegus gave the salmon to Finn to cook for him. And look, that you eat nothing of the creature, not the smallest mouthful yourself. But bring it to me as soon as it is ready. For it's wearying I've been for the taste of it this seven long years past. Then he sat him down in the doorway of his bothy and waited. And a long wait it seemed to him. At last Finn brought the salmon, steaming on a long dish of polished maple wood. But as he set it down, Finnegus looked into his face and saw there was a change in it, and that it was no longer the face of a boy. And he asked, Have you eaten any of the salmon in spite of my words to you? And Finn shook his head. I have not. But when I turned it on the spit, I scorched my thumb, and I sucked it to ease the smart. Was there any harm in that, my master? <sighs> Finn 
Finnegus sighed a deep and heavy sigh and pushed the dish away. Take the rest of the salmon and eat it, for already in the hot juice on your thumb you have had all the knowledge and power that was in it. And in you, and not in me as I had hoped, the prophecy is fulfilled. And when you have eaten, go from here, for there is nothing more that I can teach you. From that day forward, whenever Finn wished to know how some future thing would turn out, or the meaning of some mystery, or to gain tidings of events happening at a distance, he had only to put his, his scorched thumb between his teeth, and the knowledge would come to him as though it were the second sight. And another power came to him also at that time, so that he could not save the life of any sick or wounded man, no matter how near to death, by giving him a drink of water from... Sorry, I read that wrong and I knew it. I'll start that last paragraph again. Mavanri says, Anthony does an excellent disappointed druid impression. <laughs> uh, wizard is never late, Frodo Baggins, nor is he early. And another power came to him also at that time, so that he could save the life of any sick or wounded man, no matter how near to death, by giving him a drink of water from his cupped hands. Such great wisdom, huh? Fantastic. I, I think it's really, really fascinating. The whole thing about the gull uh, aid having his eye put out. I mean, the same thing happened to Midger when he visited Angus at uh, Sheed and Broga uh, or Sheed Machinog at Newgrange in Tuckmark Etain. Um, and uh, Balor had one eye. Uh, and I think MacKillop says that the one eye thing is supposed to represent a form of wisdom like this, you know, extra, uh, 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 this, this second sight or whatever. I'm also fascinated by a reference that I found, and I have to write about this at some point. I found a reference in one of the myths that uh, one of the old names for Dagda, uh, and I can't remember the source, but I have it written down. One of the old names for Dagda was he was king of Lynn Fake. Now, Lynn Fake is the pool identified as the place where Finnegus caught the salmon of knowledge uh, and by which uh, uh, Fionn or Finn came uh, to the great knowledge by burning his thumb on the salmon. Uh, now, I have tentatively identified the location of that pool uh, in my book, Mythical Ireland, New Light on the Ancient Past. Um, I love that idea uh, that that pool was so sacred that Dagda, who was kind of the chief of the two of the Danon, and the great deity was responsible for building Newgrange, apportioning all the other monuments to the various deities, should be referred to as the king of Lynn Fake. I think it's just fabulously poetic. Anyway, I'm going to do something else very briefly. Uh, we have a little bit of time. Um, Fenton inspired me greatly. Fenton MacBokra um, from, you know, uh, the uh, Lower Gawala from the story of Kazair and their arrival, the first people to come into Ireland. And also, uh, in the guise of a salmon, inspired me to write uh, The Cry of the Sebok. Uh, or in, a, in modern Irish, you would, you would say The Cry of the Shawach. Um, and I'm just going to see if I can find it. Um, so uh, I'm going to I'm going to very very briefly summarise uh, that story. Kezair, who was a granddaughter of Noah, and we did we did an episode on this, uh, came to Ireland with three men. Um, Finton was one of those, and and fifty women or thrice fifty women, depending on which version you read. Um, they they came here because they believed that because Ireland was was devoid of humans, that it was free from sin and therefore not subject to God's wrathful judgment upon the earth in the Great Flood. However, the Great Flood overtook them and they were all drowned except for Finton. Finton survived miraculously. So I have kind of retold the tale. Oh, I hope I can find it quickly now. Um, do 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 Oh, I really hope I can find it quickly. Mm -hmm. <sighs> 
Atlético. Um, hang on, I'll, I'll find it. Just give me one moment. I, have, I want to read a couple of pages from the Cry of the Sebek, which ties in very nicely with this story. Uh, and I, 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 I think you'll enjoy them. I certainly hope you do. Um, just have to find uh, the PDF and search for a couple of words that I know are uh, an exact phrase in the book, and I'll be able to find the page then. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Sorry. Forgive me. I, I'm very sorry. Um, here we go. It's page. If anybody has the cry of the Sebuk, I'll be reading uh, roughly starting. Uh, oh, yeah. It's towards the back of the books. No wonder I couldn't find it. Okay, I'll read this one a bit quicker. I was very slow to read uh, the Sutcliffe uh, Finn McCool tale because there wasn't enough text to fill out an hour. Um, so I'll read this a little bit quicker. I, I, I hope uh, I hope you can you can you can find it, or I hope you can you know, I hope you can keep up. So basically, um, uh, Fenton in this in this book is a young boy, uh, and he meets a hawk, uh, a shawak, or a sebok gui, a wind hover, uh, and the setup guides him through journeys. And in one of the journeys, uh, he meets Necton, uh, and Necton uh, shows him Necton's well. And in Necton's well, he sees a vision of this uh, occurrence uh, when they were overtaken by the water. So I'll, I'll read it as quickly as I can, uh, but not too quickly. What are they running from? Finton said aloud. Necton made no reply. Their movement up the mountain became more frantic. Their anxious look turned to one of panic. Finton looked hard to see what they might be running from. There was water, a lot of water. The sea was rising, spilling over the land. It was surging through the forests. Soon the water had reached the foot of the mountain and was continuing to rise. The group climbed hard, but as the slope became steeper, their pace slowed. The water kept advancing. He could see that it would soon catch them unless they quickened the pace of their climb. Several of the women at the rear collapsed from exhaustion, and soon the water overtook them. It was distressing to watch, but Finton knew he must persevere. The sea kept swelling and lifting until all the forests were underwater and the mountain range had become islands peering out from a great sea. And still the water kept coming. Soon it had caught up with most of the climbers and they were quickly drowned. Only the leading woman and the three men were left. They scampered up the higher slopes of the mountain, but the woman and two of the men fell behind. The water caught up with them there, and they were swept away. Only one man was left, the bearded man with the crooked staff. Finton willed him to scurry onwards. In his mind, he was calling out to the man. Hurry, hurry, he imagined himself calling. The water is coming. You must get to the top. The lone man seemed to find some renewed energy. He used his staff to help him climb the rocky slope. He was near the top now, but still the water kept coming. Its rise was ceaseless. Finton could see a cairn of stones on the summit of the mountain. The man was approaching it now, and still the water was chasing him. He watched as the man reached the summit. He ran towards the cairn. So surely the water would stop rising now, Finton thought, but it didn't. The mountain top was like a small island in a vast ocean. The rest of the land had vanished. As the water kept advancing, Finton looked as the man watched hopelessly and helplessly. As the sea came up around the base of the cairn, the man seemed to give a heavy sigh, as if acknowledging that he was defeated. He closed his eyes and raised his staff and appeared to utter some words. He looked like he was saying a prayer. When he finished, the water was around his ankles. He turned around and walked in through a narrow ent entrance into the cairn. I cannot see him now, said Finton aloud. Look closer, said Necton. Go to the cairn. In his mind, Finton, Finton imagined flying closer to the cairn, and soon he found he was able to follow the man inside. There, in the dim light, the man sat upon a huge stone in a circular chamber, awaiting his doom. He looked up from where he sat, 
with the water rising up to his waist, and met Finton's gaze. His eyes glinted. He gave a broad, affectionate smile, as if he could not only see the boy, but as if he recognised him too. He gave a friendly wink. Just then, the water came up around his neck, and he lifted his head as high as he could, and still smiling, his head disappeared into the water. Finton kept looking, hoping that perhaps the water would begin to subside, but it didn't. The whole chamber was submersed. He looked, and the man wriggled and writhed as if drowning. His shape and size changed as he convulsed. It seemed the man was transforming. His form moved around in the waters. He was swimming. The water swished and rippled, rippled and swirled so that it was difficult to see anything. After a moment, the water became calm. It seemed to become brighter as if a light was shining down through the roof of the chamber. The man had changed into a fish. It's a salmon, Finton exclaimed aloud. He saved himself by becoming a salmon. Yes, indeed, said Necton, but keep watching. Finton did as Necton said. He watched as the salmon swam in the water. The light dimmed so that the water became very dark and it was difficult to see anything. Then it brightened again as if the sun was shining down through the roof and then it grew dark again. This happened over and over in quick succession until it seemed to Finton that he was watching a long period of time elapsing quickly. After a while, he could see that the water level was dropping. The flood was subsiding. The waters lowered, revealing much of the chamber. The large stone in the centre upon which the man had been sitting before his transformation was revealed again. The water kept on receding until it was only a foot deep. The salmon flapped about in the shallow pool and then suddenly transformed. The fish grew wings and legs. It turned into an eagle and flew out of the chamber. Finton followed. He could see the sea falling slowly away from the mountain. The eagle soared above the cairn, circling in the grey sky. The day quickly gave way to night and then returned again after just a moment. The sun was flashing across the sky in great arcs and darkness would come and go in seconds. Time was passing quickly. The water descended off the mountain until the earth below was revealed. Most of the forest was gone. The land looked bare. Looking up at the bird, Finton could see it circling without much effort. After a moment, the bird's shape changed somewhat and it shrunk in size. It stopped moving in circles. Instead, it seemed to hover in the same place. It's the Sebuk, Finton shouted aloud. He heard a cry from the Sebuk, a trilling call on the air. But as he heard it, the scene shimmered and dissipated before him, and the hawk vanished in the waters of Segish. And that is, my dear friends, uh, my first proper novel, and it's called The Cry of the Sebuk. Uh, and it uh, is uh, thoroughly inspired, uh, enti entirely inspired uh, by these great stories. Uh, and, and the transformation is the miracle that actually genuinely happened, according to Irish tradition, to save Fenton from the deluge, was that he transformed into a salmon and an eagle and a hawk. Uh, and it was in the guise of a hawk uh, that he uh, he survived for many, many years afterwards. Uh, anyway, um, in case you're interested, um, I have lots of copies of The Cry of the Sebuk, unfortunately more than I would like to have. Uh, but I'll paste in a link uh, beneath the videos below uh, where you can, uh, if you want, purchase a signed copy. And I would be very glad uh, to send send that off to you uh, in the post. In fact, uh, the first person who orders one will get this copy, the one I've just read uh, live on this episode. So anyway, that's it for this evening. Uh, I'd love to read more of that, actually, at some point. I probably will. Uh, don't want to kind of spoil it completely. Um, but uh, it, it uh, 
just in case you're interested, uh, it's 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 endorsed uh, by two very good friends, uh, Morgan Daimler and uh, Judith Nylon. Uh, Morgan says it's a fascinating story that weaves together fiction and folklore. And Judith says this is a story of hope and possibility. It is salve for the soul. So hopefully. Uh, you might also enjoy that. By the way, it's not written with any age uh, or reader in mind, uh, but certainly uh, would probably suit uh, young uh, sort of t teenage readers as much as adult. It's been very enjoyable this evening. I was very glad to see so many of you on the impromptu live stream from Newgrange um, a couple of nights or three. It was a Thursday we did the live stream from Newgrange uh, after... Uh, live Irishman. So look, I'll try to do more of that. I did promise I would try to do more of that. So just a final reminder that those of you who haven't ordered your 2020 Island of the Setting Sun, it would probably be a good idea uh, to do so now. Uh, order yourself a signed copy uh, on the website. I I'm, can't be guaranteed uh, that, that I'll be able to fulfill all the demand for them. That's what I'm saying anyway. <laughs> That's a good sales pitch, isn't it? Between now and the next time, I hope that you all stay safe and stay well, not just with the pandemic, but with everything else that's going on in the world at the moment. It's nice to have these little havens of uh, community, isn't it, uh, where we can come together and have our little uh, gatherings. In the meantime, um, you look, do your best. Um, wash your hands. Use hand sanitizer when you're outside. Try to distance yourself from other people as much as possible. Wear a face mask if you're in the, the shopping mall or the shopping centre or if you're on public transport or, or you're within uh, close the close vicinity of uh, other people. I uh, don't know what next week's episode's going to be, but look, sure, we'll, 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 we've tons of stuff. We've tons of stuff. And actually, even on the Finn cycle, I was thinking that the story of the Battle of the White Strand, uh, the Battle of Fentry, uh, would probably take... I reckon four or five episodes to get through. So there's tons of stuff still to come, tons and tons and tons. Uh, it, it, some of it might be a little bit obscure, um, but look, in fairness, uh, some people might say Tukmark Emira, the wooing of Emer, uh, was a bit obscure. Uh, but in fairness, there are some real gems in there. In the meantime, uh, I hope you all have a great day wherever you are in the world. Uh, stay safe and stay healthy. That's the main thing. And don't forget to come back next week. In the meantime, it's uh, Slonga Fold, Kolosov. Uh, no, I got that wrong, didn't I? <laughs> uh, uh, Kolosov is the... No, Slonga Fold is bye for now. So that should be the last thing I say. But anyway, in the meantime, uh, great to see you all. And uh, great to see a few people who uh, have been away uh, coming back. Uh, don't forget to tell your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Take it easy, folks. Bye-bye. Sloan.